tēnei au, tēnei au te hōkai nei o toko toko wai ko te hōkai nuku ko te hōkai rangi ko te hōkai atō tūpuna tāne nui a rangi. I pukiti ai ki ngā rangi tū hāhā ko te tehi o mano no i roku hinga tu rāku i o matua kore ana ki. I riro u hōai ko ngā kito te wānanga ko te kiti tu auri ko te kiti tu ate ko te kiti arono ie. Kā tiritiri a kā paupau a kia papatua nuku kia puta ko tātou ti ira tangata ki te pai ao ki te ao māra mo uhi. Wero tau mai te mauri, hau mie, kui e, tai. Tai ki e. A nā ko nāno, a ea ku nui, a ku rahi, a ku whakatamarahi ki te rangi. A kei ngā mā tāwaka puta no i te motu, e ngā iwi, ngā iwi taketake puta noa. I te ao nei, a nau mai, haere mai, whakatau mai rā, a ki tēnei wānanga tahi o tātou. A nō ku anō te honore ki a whakahaere, e kawe nei i tēnei kaupupa kōrero mo te ata nei. I runga anō i te mōhio ka pēhi a rawatia tātou katoa e tēnei māwiwi, tēnei urutā, tēnei mate e ngā oki hāri ana puta nō i te ao. Hoi eno kia matāra tātou katoa, i runga anō i tērā ākotanga. Hoi eno ka huri au ki te kaupupa te rā nei, e tikāna kia huri i taku reo ki te reo tangata tiriti, Koe no, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Mōrena atamāri e, good morning everybody. It is certainly a pleasure, certainly an honour and a treat to be able to host this webinar series this morning. I'd like to acknowledge everybody who is currently tuning in this morning from different parts of the world. Welcome and greetings all the way from Tāmaki Makaurau, Auckland, uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, to also our many whanaunga across this land of Aotearoa who are also tuning in, uh, ngā mihi nui ki a koutou katoa, and I'd like to acknowledge your presence in this space as well. I'd also like to acknowledge um, the phenomena that's happening across the world, um, and so just to keep everybody just notions of um, safety, um, and I hope we're looking after each other and being kind to one another and so on. So um, this webinar is actually quite ideal in terms of self-isolation and tuning in, and, but still getting um, the fruits of a wānanga or a robust, robust conversation. So I'd like to acknowledge everyone into this space. Um, and you are in the right space. Um, and this kaupapa kōrero or this subject is the paternalism to partnership, one courageous conversation about race at a time. Um, I'm going to very soon introduce our speakers and our speakers are Kat Poi and uh, Matthew Ferry. Um, but just some, before I do that, just some housekeeping um, just so we can ensure that this runs as smoothly as possible. Um, we will be running just a, a few minutes past um, 8.30 because we just uh, did start a few minutes after 7.30. Um, so how this session is gonna run is very soon, I'm gonna hand it over to Kat um, who's going to define the parameters or rather um, let everybody know uh, how this session will be run. This is a fireside chat, so that we want this session to be as interactive as possible. And how you can interact um, with this kaupapa, with this conversation, is uh, by posting um, some feedback or some, um, some discussion uh, through the chat box. I'm going to leave that for Kat to um, explain further. Um, but just to um, end on that note, um, as we head towards the last 10 minutes of the session, there will be opportunity for ourselves to ask some questions and with some answers. So a Q&A session. Now you can post your questions um, and if everything is running properly on your guys' side, there should be a Q&A box that will pop up, pop up on your screen. Um, and that screen I can also see. And so I'll select um, some of those questions, given that we only have 10 minutes for the session, um, for our um, guest presenters uh, to be able to um, answer. And so Fano, this is a wānanga, or rather a robust discussion. Um, and so as I understand that we would like as many people to interact with the session as possible. And again, I'm going to leave that to um, Kat to explain. Hoio no rā, ka huri au ki te kaupapa te rā. Te kaupapa kōrero me ngā kaufau kōrero. So now I turn uh, my direction over to our speakers um, and I'd like to introduce um, to the panel um, Itemare Kura Kat Poi, 
Mm, um, exactly. nui ki a koe te whanaungo tainui waka ko tāua tāua nō tērā uh, me te mōhio ana hoki uh, tō uh, whakapapa ki e raonga mau, te raonga mautere o te moana nui a kiwa nō rira malu ele lei uh, i rotu i tēnei mm. ata. So welcome Cat Poi. Um, me te kai kōrero uh, tuarua ki a koe Matthew, Matthew Ferry um, ngā mihi nui ki a koe uh, me o pūtunga. Uh, nō mātua nō Te mare nui. We are very honoured and privileged to have both of you um, discussing your kaupapa kōrero. I'm certainly very interested in um, some of the things that we're going to be discussing this morning. Poeno ka mutunga pahu pahu ki kona. I'll just leave it there for now and I'll hand it over to you, Kat, to take it away. Ngā mihi nui, da rau, da rau, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora, tēnā tātou katoa i mua te timata me mihi atu ki a koe e Valence. Nāna te rā i whakapuari i tēnei kōrero, kei te mihi, kei te mihi, kei te mihi. Uh, kia koutou katoa, uh, tēnā rā tātou. Uh, ko ai au, he ria hau nō Waikato Tainui, nō Te Aroa Hoke, uh, ki te taho tāku papa, nō te mana nui a hiwa um, a hau. Uh, ko au tētahi o ngā Equity Transformation Consultants mō te Courageous Conversation South Pacific Institute. Ko Kat Poe tōku ingoa, nō mai, hara mai, uh, kia ora everyone, I'm Kat. Um, thank you Valence for having us this morning. Um, and before I get started with some opening comments around paternalism to partnership, I just want to reiterate what Valence said about um, session being an interactive one. So our hope is that you will interact um, with us in the chat box. Um, we do have a series of activities lined up. Um, our intention is to share some practical tools around how to um, improve the way in which we talk about race and race relations and racism. And um, in talking about it, we offer um, you, the chat box this morning, to uh, share and answer uh, in response to our questions. Um, we're going to have 10 minutes at the end of the session to uh, mop up anything that needs clarifying in relation to the topic. So I just really <coughs> encourage you, if you do have questions at the end, to centre them on uh, the tools that we're going to be um, sharing with you this morning. Um, but for me, um, you know, thinking about paternalism to partnership and one courageous conversation about um, a t at a time. You know, for me, developing a personal connection uh, to the way in which paternalism has manifested in my life, from moving from kind of accepting, often unconsciously, the well-intended and yet sustained ignorance of others, and moving from there to um, to a place of conscious, com consistent commitment to the power sharing relationship expressed in the treaty, um, you know, leads me to asking real critical questions of myself. And some of those questions are centered around, what does it mean to fully decolonize myself? What activities do I need to undertake to uh, reflect um, what it is that my tupuna had intended for me? And as I centre race, recognising that race and race in my life, um, asking myself, what are the activities that are similar to my treating partners and what are the activities that are necessarily different to my treaty partners in understanding what it means to be um, in an authentic power sharing relationship. On, on Saturday, I was tuned into Moana Jackson's webinar, and I heard her say, let me just check my notes, that having an honest race-based conversation of colonisation is a journey New Zealand needs to take. And so for me, moving from paternalism to partnership calls us to leaning in to having courageous conversations about race. Let me um, hand that echo over to my colleague. Kia ora tātou, uh, no Lebanon aho ko um, Arazaurab toku monga, ko Wadi Kadisha toku te awa, ko Fahri toku iwi, uh, ke tamaki makaurau aho e ma noho ana, ke te whariwānanga o Courageous Conversations About Race aho e mahi ana, um, toku fa oku tamariki, 
Kojano Takohoaranga Tera, Ko Matthew Fadi Tenai. Um, welcome so much to this um, to this webinar, and um, I'm just going to go straight into it because well, I can see the time ticking away. Um, thank you for turning up today, and for me, paternalism to partnership um, is a personal note. Um, it's where I'm at on the continuum as Tangata Treaty, um, and that's where we wrote it from. So if you think of all of the different ways in which we can have relationships, paternalism being that very parental, sort of we're going to bring you along with us, that colonial, um, which I've spent a lifetime trying to, uh, you know, take apart, to, to as Kat said, this um, partner or real power sharing um, thing. And the, the second part of the title is a note to myself also, because it said one courageous conversation about race at a time is really saying to me, first, I've had to have a number of courageous conversations about race to myself, first and foremost, even before I've had a courageous conversation with someone else. Um, and one of the first steps in my journey was just to acknowledge uh, myself as Tangata Treaty. Um, that with that comes some responsibilities and for that I needed guidance and I, again, Moana Jackson, he says the treaty is not um, something that is to be settled uh, or finalised, it's to be honoured. And so that was my first step of how much in my personal and professional life am I honouring uh, the treaty. Um, he also talks about very clearly um, about how uh, someone, myself being Tangata Treaty, how have I at times in my life, in my personal and professional life, either enabled or disabled um, Tangata Whenua's uh, ability to uh, stand in their Turanga Waiwai. Um, and that's a hard question for me because um, sometimes my actions haven't always been um, enabling, um, to say the least. And so how do we get to courageous conversations? Well, I actually agree. Um, last week, uh, the, last weekend, I think there was an article that Dr. Um, Elena Curtis wrote, uh, Itangata. She says, I love my culture, but it's not the answer to Māori health in inequities. And it's an amazing article to look at how... Um, Although in 2009, when I decided to bring this work to New Zealand, I was very heavily involved in, um, you know, cultural types of professional development, cultural types of training. And I felt there was something missing. Of course, that is ultimately important. And this particular program doesn't replace that. But what it says is um, there is a power dynamic that we also have to challenge. There is a race dynamic that we also have to challenge. And so I found this book in about 2009, I guess. Um, it wasn't this version, but I picked it up somewhere the book found me or I found the book I'm not too sure and I read this book and I thought this is a missing piece because what I noted was in my own personal life um, and you would have heard from my pipiha I'm a Lebanese New Zealander so I grew up discussing race constantly in the house and I know I noted that no one really had any tools it would often end up in either silence or violence so some people would be shut down um, while others would get angry um, and we never really had productive conversations it was almost like a no-no don't go there because uncle will do this or auntie will do this. And, you know, so I noted that in, in my professional life also, people were unable to have conversations about race, um, not in any way that took the conversation forward. Um, and so we brought the work around, around about 2012 to um, Unitech, started using it in classrooms. Um, then it started to show some real results. And then when we started to sort of say, well, this has got a power for New Zealand, we went to the Kuia and Kamatua of Unitech at the time and we asked a question. And the question was simple. Will this program benefit Māori? Um, they came back with a couple of uh, suggestions. They said, yes, it will. A critical conversation about race could really benefit um, our ability to move from you know, a paternalistic relationship uh, to authentic partnership. They said, but one of the things we want you to be aware of is that we don't want the Māori voice to become invisible in this. And so part of our co-papa is that we always work in partnership. Uh, whenever we do a workshop, um, whenever we do anything with organisations anywhere across the South Pacific, there is always tanga to whenua leading out and there is always a treaty partner with them or we're not available. Um, so that's part of our co-papa to ensure that the Māori voice is always at the, at the, at the centre of these conversations because if we're centering race in Aotearoa, we have to deal with that initial contradiction and that initial contradiction set the scene for the entire history of this country, that initial racial contradiction. Um, and I guess the last thing they said to us was, um, please don't position this work 
um, we said we're not positioning it as a replacement of anything that's been done. In fact, we are here as, uh, and we, we, we call ourselves, we call our training Hoa Haere. Uh, we're traveling companions to all of the other things that need to be to be done in this space for everything from treaty training um, to the Rao to all of these things that all of us need to partake in um, to move ourselves along that continuum. And so that's really how the work got here. Um, <clears throat> and the final thing that I just want to introduce is the fact that we, we, we started a institute um, to, to hold this work uh, at Unitech in 2016, stayed there for two years, um, left Unitech in 2018. We're now independent. Um, we have two arms. We have a for-profit organization and we have a non-for-profit organization and our for-profit supports our non-profit. And our non-profit is now operating in New Zealand. Uh, so we're funding students and youth in schools and in um, universities to do this work. Um, so that's where I'd like to hand back to Kat, I think. So thanks, Matt. I heard Matt um, talk about um, often our conversations around race are silent, violent. And so um, in relearning how to have healthy, productive, generative conversations about race um, and recognising that sometimes what people see of who it is that I am as a brown skinned Māori woman on the outside interferes with their ability to really understand who it is that I am on the inside. And who I am on the inside is all the stuff that I want to be able to share. But race, um, in its most superficial form, interferes with our ability to really connect and understand with one another. And so um, in recognising that this happens, one of our pre-tools is called Place, Name and Intention. And um, I'm going to invite participants now, um, speaking into Place, Name and Intention, to share in the chat, in the chat box um, place, where are you coming from? Where are you at this morning? You know, for me, I shared with you in my pepeha that I hail from the lands and waterways of Waikato Tainui and Te Arua and also um, the island of Tonga. And um, as I stand firmly in the South Pacific as a Māori woman, my place in the world is derived and my understanding about race and my beliefs about race have been socialised in how it is that I stand um, in the South Pacific. My name uh, also has a, has a story that um, expresses some of my beliefs and understandings about race and has helped shape these. My name is Catherine Kasanita Poi and my mother and father were purposeful and intentional in offer, giving me um, an English name. Um, I was born in Australia um, and so race is already being um, considered before I was even uh, born. Uh, so my name is Catherine. My middle name is Kasanita after my great grandmother. My uh, surname is Poi, it's my married name. It's a derivative of Poi Afasi. Um, Fussy, um, the sound in Nguyen language is spelled with a T. And my husband's whanau also made a conscious choice um, that has a story about race in, in this choice um, to drop the fussy part of their name. And, you know, I have feelings about that. That is, um, that is something that I recognize as Māori uh, as a shared experience. Um, and my intention always is to uh, share these tools that have been transformative in my life um, to change the way in which we relate to one another along racial lines and across racial difference. And in bringing forward uh, this racial consciousness to also acknowledge that healing needs to happen. That um, for me, there's a lot of mamai to, or hurt to um, process as I'm developing racial consciousness and as I'm seeking to lean into what it means to be in an um, authentic, uh, legitimate power sharing relationship um, as afforded by Te Tiriti or Waitangi. So place name and intention, please um, get, that, get that chat box uh, going. Uh, we've got Wellington, I've got some, ah, we've got some people from the US, um, Colorado, got um, my tuakana online, Atamari. Um, and so keep those coming in as Matt takes us through what place name and intention offers us as we move into the first tool. <coughs> And this is part of our contextualization of the program because where can you start this conversation? You start it with place, name and intention, your connection to the whenua. And so 
my, um, this is about a relatability tool. If I'm going to have a courageous conversation about race with you, first we need to build some trust. Difficult conversations need relationships and they need trust built into them. So I can't have a conversation. Now I'm seeing all these beautiful nameplates and it changes my whole, um, the way I'm even communicating, even across thing. I can see, um, you know, people coming from different places. My story is, um, I don't know what you saw when I first arrived into this webinar. For those who have never seen my face before, that first level of race is very powerful. So just what did you see? Did you see a white guy? Did you see a man of color? Did you see something in between? What did you see when you looked at me? That's that outside piece, which is where we start with race. There are other levels of race, culture, and consciousness. But what did you see? I want you to think about that right now. And now I'm going to take you inside to my place name and intention. My people came to Aotearoa 130 years ago from Lebanon. And uh, when they came here, they weren't, un they weren't able to love being Lebanese and love being um, from Aotearoa because it was, um, as you know, the imperial colonial construction of New Zealand was about assimilation into one kind of way. Now I stand with you in this webinar today telling you um, that I'm proud to be an Arab and I love Lebanon but I also love Aotearoa and my other connection to place is seeing myself as Tangata Treaty. I'd like to see you, I'd like to acknowledge that's my truth. I'm Tangata Treaty of Lebanese descent. That's who I am. I'm, a, I'm an Arab. So then you think of my name, Matthew Ferry. Is that Arabic? Whoa, no. It's Hebrew to begin with, and then there's an English Irish part at the end. So, what did my people do when they came here? They changed their name, they changed everything about them, uh, you know, all those ethnic components, to be able to get the goodies, to be able to fit into whiteness, to be able to comply with the Pakiha world to get more out of it. So, here I am. My real name is Matta Fakhri. And if you heard my Pepeha, I would have I said, uh, I'm, we're tribal based people. And finally, my intention is the same as cats um, in, in many cases. I'm, I've, I've done a lot of consciousness raising activities in my life. You know, where you do cultural awareness and awareness about this and anti-racism awareness. And really what I know is that it becomes out of balance if there's not some healing. So my intention is always with this work to heal my, to, to raise my own consciousness, uh, to, heal myself um, and to share these tools so that others can do the same. So that's the first part of relatability. We're going to take you into the second part of relatability. Jeff, if we can have the uh, Courageous Conversation Compass up. Um, so we just go down. Oh, we can stop here for a second, Jeff. Just go back to that one. Just want to introduce what it is. So um, if we can go back one slide. Yeah, so this is what Courageous Conversations actually is as a body of, we call it a protocol. So Courageous Conversations is utilizing four agreements, six conditions and a compass in order to first engage, then sustain and deepen intraracial and interracial dialogue about race and is an essential foundation for examining and addressing institutionalized culture and structures that promote, promote racial disparities. Whoa, that's big, but that's really the definition of what it is. And the intraracial part first is that internal piece having a courageous conversation with oneself first, and then people who share your same sort of racial affinity. And then of course, there's the inter across racial, different racial groups. So one of our first tools um, is the Courageous Conversation Compass, which we can bring up now, Jeff. And this is again, looking at how we create relatability, right? Relatability is huge if we're going to have these conversations in a wide sense, in a wider sense. And they're very, the, the tools are, about how do we have conversations that make these conversations compassionate, productive, and generative. You know, um, a lot of people come to our workshops and think, oh, you're going to teach me how to call people out. Uh, that's what's courageous. No, actually, what's courageous is calling people into a conversation. Yeah? And sticking with people who have uh, such different beliefs from yourself for long enough so that you can hold that conversation in that space. So another tool of relatability, and this, this tool really just navigates the conversation and helps us to understand where, other, where we're coming from, where others are coming from. And it has four quadrants. I'll go through them quickly and I'll give you an activity and you can get that chat box going again. So the first one you can see there is believing. Um, believings, uh, that stuff is what I believe. What I think is right and wrong, what I believe is good and bad, it sits right down in the puku. It's sometimes really hard to articulate. We sometimes think we have a belief about something, but it's not until we interrogate it. 
Um, and this is a powerful part of where our work lies in the belief quadrant. Yeah. Um, the other quadrant there is thinking, that's that intellectual quadrant. A lot of academics, um, we love to sit in that quadrant. We love to um, analyze, ask questions. Yeah. The other quadrant down below there is on, uh, the feeling quadrant. So we also have emotions. What, what are we feeling right now? Um, and there's the acting quadrant. That's our relational quadrant. Also, all the things we do, uh, all the doing things we do, um, often a lot of verbs. Um, so I'm going to just put something up. Um, and I'll come back to the compass, but I just want to put something up and I want you to use that chat box. Um, if we can just go to the next slide there, Jeff. So it's a simple, um, simple two words. Um, and this is really about, well, I won't really say anything more. What does that mean to you when you read those two words, just two simple words, race matters. What comes up for you now we're sitting wherever you are in your home and your workplace across the world? what comes up but what's more important than what comes up is where do you immediately go on the compass do those words send you to the believing quadrant do they send you to the feeling quadrant are you thinking about them you know you're thinking race matters what do they mean are you in the acting quadrant i want to see that chat box go so position yourself if we can go back to the um compass jeff so where are you right now guys start putting words in what is, uh, name your quadrant and start to then um, thinking. I see someone coming through on thinking, thinking, believing, feeling. What is, what's a feeling if you're feeling? <laughs> nice. Uh, I'm, I'm in the feeling, feeling, uh, and certainly for me, um, feeling manifests in, in ways where I can't find the word. And so love, love seeing that, uh, uh, that it's more of a sensation that sometimes when I'm um, in dialogue or seeing a particular circumstance unravel, I have. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. Go, if we can just go back to the compass for two seconds there, Jeff. Wow, I love this coming through. So already we're positioning ourselves and that's your first sort of activity with the compass. So I just wanna speak a little bit more about the compass. So what we find in conversations is when, a, when someone who's deep in feelings trying to speak to a, a thinker, you know, and you know when that happens, we end up sort of, oh, you can't see my hands, but you end up in sort of speaking at cross purposes. And if someone's talking about, they're just angry about something and someone else is saying, we don't have budget for it. <laughs> the conversation doesn't really go very well um, until we somehow listen to each other and where each other are coming from. And so again, we're in the right, we're still trying to build up some ability to relate in a very difficult confronting conversation because that's how race is constructed in our society as confrontational. And so where we really have a preference, and I saw a lot of that coming through, was um, thinking and acting. Thinking, acting, thinking, acting, thinking, acting. Um, we sit in that, we, we've been socialized, that that's the, especially in our professional lives, that is the dominant place to be. You know, let's do another strategy, another strategy, then we'll evaluate it, then we'll move it forward, then we'll do this, thinking, acting, thinking, acting. Actually, what we're saying with this compass is to have a real full conversation about race and racism, you need to be in believing and feeling as well. And all of us have all of those quadrants. We don't sit in one. Sometimes we have a very dominant, um, you know, uh, we have a dominant uh, quadrant. For example, if um, you've never been the victim of racism, you often enter racism from a thinking quadrant. You know, what is racism? How am I connected to it? If you've been the victim of racism over and over again in your life, um, and it's constantly beating down on you, you often enter through feeling. Yeah. And so to be to first just acknowledge there's a bigger conversation than where I'm sitting in the compass, um, predominantly, and I need to know how to get to how to um, see it from other people's perspectives. So there's a middle place here called Modi Toe, and that's where we where we say the best place to have a, a courageous conversation is from that point. That's our central point. That's our wholeness point. That's our settled point. So all of us have believing, thinking, feeling, and acting. But often when we're too deep in feeling, um, we, we aren't our better selves in a conversation. So for me, there's four sort of activities, four sort of ways you can use the compass. First, locate yourself. And you've just done that beautifully, right, on the chat board. I'm in feeling. Ah, I'm in feeling, someone wrote. 
couldn't describe the feeling, but they were locating themselves. The second is to move towards the center, right? And everyone's modi toe would be different, yeah? Sometimes if I'm really angry, I have to go home and have a sleep overnight before I'm ready to have a conversation. Because if you have a conversation with me when I'm deep in feeling, and you're in thinking, and I think I'm in thinking too, it doesn't work out very well for me, because I think I'm in thinking, but I'm actually in feeling, and it can come across in all sorts of uh, ways that aren't productive. So first, it's about locating yourself. Then it's about moving to your modi toe. Now, we take two days to introduce these tools. That's why we're speaking so fast. The next, the next thing is to look around and see where, my, where the person I'm com, um, communicating with is at. And I can see you better when I'm at my modi toe place, my settled place. The fourth act to action is to move to where you are, not try and drag you over to where I am. You know, a lot of my life, I'm very passionate um, and people have always tried to control my feelings and emotions. Um, oh, do you need to go home and have a little bit of a break or whatever? Um, and I've often wanted to say to them, well, do you need to go and take a break? Because you're always in thinking. You never leave that quadrant. So we can't have a full conversation. And so locate yourself, move to the center, see where other people are, and then go and meet those people where they are. And if you're a leader or a teacher or something else, the only way you're really going to lead people to where they need to get to or teach people to where they get to is if you meet them where they are. And that's a fifth sort of thing. So that's your Courageous Conversation Compass. Um, what's next up there? Um, moving into the agreements, Kat. Yeah, I was just um, really appreciate all the comments that are coming through on the webinar chat. Um, keep them rolling in. Um, I was just thinking about uh, my experience working in large organisations where there is a preference to think and act and that as a Māori woman being socialised into race in my emotional quadrant but learning that um, the most appropriate way of being um, in my professional space was in a thinking and acting quadrant, um, it impacted my productivity because I didn't have an outlet to express that emotion in a way that I felt like I was being and so um, often um, when I'm in, in that feeling space of frustration or anger or um, just that, you know, that sensation that I was talking about, the outward expression for me would often be uh, passive aggressive. You know, those kind of meetings where I just, my emotional, my emotional state of being um, was not being acknowledged and um, being forced into thinking through what it was that was happening around me, how much um, healthier would our relationships be with one another if there was just space for a, a conversation about what that feeling and emotional um, state of being is? And how much healthier would that conversation be if those emotions compelled people to be different? Um, so I'll, I'll leave that with you and move us into the next set of tools, which we call the four agreements. I wonder if you can bring those up, Jeff. And the four agreements are like our roadmap. Um, they're the things that hold us in our conversations about race. And what they do is they call us into um, unlearning the typical behaviors that we've learned in um, speaking into race and racism. And so the first one is stay engaged. That, uh, We've been taught to disengage or run away from conversations. Certainly that was my experience. I knew from a very young age that um, putting race on the table and talking about it um, was not something that was going to be received well. And so I inherently learned that um, disengaging um, was disengaging from conversations about race was the preferred modus operandi. So our first agreement is to stay engaged. Stay engaged with self. Stay engaged with uh, your conversation with self, staying engaged with um, the people around you, and staying engaged with the national conversation. We're in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, we're in a global pandemic at the moment. But staying engaged calls us to really focus on what's happening around us. Um, the second agreement is experience discomfort. And that, again, being socialized into um, feeling comfortable all the time and knowing that people who are the victims of racism are not afforded that, uh, that level of comfort that others are afforded. And, you know, 
um, when did we uh, learn that discomfort was a bad thing? That actually experiencing dis discomfort, and I mean, I don't mean uh, kind of peeking out, or um, I mean that experiencing discomfort enables us to stretch our stretch our learning. Uh, it enables us to kind of grow our racial, what I call our racial. Um, it, it helps us to grow our capacity to sit and converse with people who may have completely opposing beliefs to us and that there is an opportunity for um, connection and learning in those moments. So experiencing discomfort, we all have different experiences of race and racism. Um, we know how the world treats us um, in our own stories. And so um, leaning into um, being uncomfortable with a view that that helps us raise our racial consciousness is necessary. And the third one is speak your truth. Um, speak your truth and speak your truth to self. So one of the things that you'll hear Matt and I often uh, reference is the need to have this conversation with self and figure out um, where you are um, before you go and have a conversation with someone else. So what is your truth? And is the truth that you're speaking yourself the truth that is coming out your mouth when you're speaking with other people? And if there is a misalignment with that, what's it gonna really, what's it gonna take? What's it gonna take to speak into um, a, a part of yourself that you might not um, often speak into? And speaking truth to power, you know? What's it gonna take for you to articulate what that experience is, knowing that, um, for me especially, feeling fearful sometimes of speaking truth to power, that there's often a retribution. That when I really speak my truth, uh, um, sometimes I feel like I'm putting myself um, on the line or on trial. And so at any particular moment, um, figuring out, you know, do I have the capacity to uh, lean into speaking truth um, or um, do I expect and accept non-closure for now? So expect and accept non-closure is the fourth agreement is, um, for me as a Māori woman, I stand on the shoulders of my tūpuna who have been having this conversation for hundreds of years. And I believe that um, this is an issue that arrived long before I was here and it's going to be around long after I leave. And this tendency to, in my conversations, to want to tie things up or come to a, um, a tidy close or a particular set of actions is when it comes to race um, and racial dialogue, sometimes that's just not going to happen and we're not going to solve the issue of racism, personal racism, institutional racism in any one conversation. So expecting um, and accepting non-closure also means that we have an opportunity to re-enter the conversation um, at any particular time. And so what I offer you um, in the chat box is, I like these agreements too, Francis, thank you, um, is, you know, consider which agreement you might struggle with the most in your conversations about race. And uh, put those in the chat box. Um, for me, expect and accept non-closure is the one that I struggle with the most. And it's because nothing can move fast enough towards racial equity for me. So I feel constantly frustrated at the pace in which racial equity isn't being accelerated or achieved. And um, kind of getting back on the bandwagon and keeping those conversations that what I say might raise racial consciousness that might lead to a different set of actions is, um, you know, sometimes I really struggle with that. Um, so what have we got? What have we got in the chat? Uh, experience discomfort, right, I hear you. Certainly when I started in this work, experiencing discomfort was something that I really had to um, learn to enjoy, like, I, why not celebrate discomfort, right? Why, why not celebrate discomfort? Why not celebrate the potential that comes with being in uncomfortable situations instead of running away from it? Um, what else have we got? Ex uh, speaking truth. Yeah, Linda Graff, thank you. Speaking your truth because as Parky, I'm not sure my truth should be shared when I rate others' experience over mine. That's right. a big one. And yeah. so what I offer with Speak Your Truth, again, is, you know, speaking truth to self. So what is, it? What is your truth? Where did that truth come from? And um, what is it going to take for you to be able to communicate that um, 
in a way which, where you uh, can honour your voice. That actually we all have, um, our voices are important and our perspectives are important. And if we're not going to talk about it, how are we going to um, stem the racial disparities that we can't continue to see across multiple social indicators? Matt, do you want to add anything? No, I want to move on because we are having too much fun and we've just got a little bit behind time, but we'll get, um, I just see what's coming through. Um, if you can take us, Jeff, to the, um, where it comes up with engage. Yeah, that first uh, tier on the thing, the word engage. So now we're going to introduce probably just the first tier. Um, the tiers, so you've got now the you've got a couple of tools. You've got the compass and you've got place name and intention, which build the, um, you know, the relatability part to have a really difficult conversation. Now you've got some agreements. And if we all actually stick to those agreements, we've all got to agree with, agree to them. And as Kat said, you know, the one agreement doesn't work without the others. Um, and so it's a sort of a communal thing. If we all um, say we're going to experience discomfort and we're going to stick to that, then, then we can create a different kind of space. And then we, we hold the space to have the courageous conversation. There are actually three tiers, engage, sustain, and deepen. We're probably only going to get to deepen to, uh, to engage today. Um, but these, now you go methodically through these to have a courageous conversation about race. And I put up those words, race matters, because race does matter right? And we've got a real problem. A lot of people have a real problem thinking that race matters. Uh, we're past race or we need to talk about racism. Right. But there's a basis to race, just even the visual. So I know this. Um, I know it theoretically, but I also know it when I walk down the street with Kat Poy, my colleague, because Kat Poy and I have different experiences simply based on the way we look as both um, our racial identities and our gender identities come into play. But today's about race. And so I know that that first moment of the impact is an important question for us to ask. And if you look at this first tier, which is based on um, ancient comedic thought, it's know thyself. Uh, we were often taught at university that know thyself came from the Bible or um, Socrates. It actually didn't. Actually, Socrates himself acknowledges it comes from ancient African thought, know thyself. Um, and so this first thing is know thyself. And it's very much based on the legitimacy of our personal experience. Everybody, no matter what, racial background you have has a racial experience every day and that's where we speak from the personal racial experiences our beliefs and perspectives while demonstrating respectful understanding of specific historical as well as contemporary local immediate racial context so we're always focused on the local yeah where we are living it's nice to talk about donald trump but that's not what we're tasked with we're tasked with achieving you know um, a treaty-based future um, also, immediate's beautiful because immediate's, as I raise my consciousness in this area, um, I have the potential to change. And we legitimize personal experience. Personal experience is enough for you to talk about the racial dynamic in society. So here goes our first activity. Now, we remember we do a, a workshop over two days, so we're rushing through this. But I'm going to ask you a question, and you just need to put a number in the chat room, in the chat box. So uh, can we go to the next slide, please, Jeff? So this helps us center race. It helps us understand race. So the, the, the question for you is, how much is my life impacted by race? Now, we ask you to put a number up now, um, not zero, because if you're even thinking about it, it has an impact. Uh, I see a hundreds come through immediately, 85. Um, and so whatever that number is, is perfect for you right now. And this is answering this question. So anywhere from one to 100. Cool. So you're all putting your numbers in and just reflecting on that, you can take this away and reflect on it for some time. So what we usually find, there's a couple of patterns we find with this question. Number one, um, people usually change the question. So immediately they read it, how much is my life impacted ne negatively by race, right? And that's not what the question asks because race can be both, uh, can we go to the next screen, screen please, Jeff? Race can be both positive and negative. Does that change your score? Does that lift your score up and down if we put that in there? Remember, racism's negative. Race is always at play. It's not always racism um, that manifests itself when race is at play. So positive and negative. 
The other thing that is often a block for people is, um, especially Pākehā people, they think, oh, well, how many, how much of my day or week uh, I've got, you know, I work with a Māori colleague, I've got an Asian friend, um, I'm in a club with a Samoan person, oh, that's how I'm impacted by race. No, um, actually, you're impacted by race because you also have a race. Um, but this can be a block for some people, possibly not the people who are writing in here. Um, and then another one, what people try to do, when I first did this activity a long time ago, I, um, I was dividing myself up into a pie chart. I'm a man, um, I'm you know, also of my ethnicity, I'm an Arab, these sorts of things. But actually I'm 100% I'm Arab and I also have a racial identity, yeah? And so I'm 100% a man and that's an experience I have 100% of the impacts on me 100% of the time. So they're just some prompts. And if we go to the next slide, Jeff, um, and so really the point of this activity, people start with very low numbers and we're trying to talk to them. The idea of impact, we proceed with the idea that racial, the racial impact is 100% of the time. So I never take off my skin. I never stop having my racial experience all day, every day, even when I'm at home. Um, and so we haven't got enough time to unpack that here. But the point about this is we just ask the impact. The impact is... Um, is important because if your number's really low, if you only believe that race impacts your life 25% uh, of the time, then you don't have the ability to become conscious of it more than 25%. So the bottom number, um, you know, uh, will dictate the top number. And the, and, the, and the potential here is if we have a, a very high uh, bottom number, we, can, we open ourselves up to being conscious of how race impacts our life and the lives of others. Right, and that's the point of this activity. You, people can see critical race theory in this now, and decol theories around centering race. Race matters, so let's have a conversation about it. Um, if you don't believe race matters, and I do, we can't continue the conversation. It's okay if you don't believe race matters, and you're open to having that conversation. So that's really that. And one of the tools that we'll leave you with, and Kat will speak to this, if, um, is one of the ways you can build after when you accept or you look at your racial impact, one of the ways to build your racial comp um, consciousness is we call it the racial autobiography. So we get people to focus on their earliest experience of race or racism when they sort of lost their racial innocence, you know, and then their most recent experience of race and race. And these sort of your bookends and that most recent experience is not always an experience that happened yesterday. It might be, it's that experience that you continue to know that race matters in this world. Yeah. Kat, you might want to take over there. And, and so I'll just leave you um, as we come to the end. Thanks, Matt. Um, with what uh, per, the engaged here sounds like in relation to the racial autobiography bookends, if you can bring up the what is my earliest and most recent slide, please, Jeff. Um, and there you'll see a photo of me uh, with my sister. And I was three years old. I knew I was Māori and Tongan. I knew I was brown. I knew my mother was Māori and dark brown, and I knew my father was Tongan, Irish, and uh, the lightest skinned of our family of four. Uh, as a child, my mother would always fuss over what my sister and I looked like, you can see in our, in our picture. Um, our hair was always clean, brushed and tied back. Our clothes were always in pristine condition. Um, one day I remember my mum saying in response to my protest of being so done up, you can see that long socks covered my thick brown legs. And uh, I would often wear long socks and long trousers um, to cover up the bruises that I'd often come home with from playing so hard. And anyway, one day I remember my mum saying in response to my protest of being so done up, uh, she said, we don't need anyone looking at us or saying, ooh, look at those Padu Māori girls. We don't need anyone questioning about where the bruises on your legs came from because they might not believe that you got them from playing they might think I gave them to you. And it was at this time in my socialization that I began to understand that being Māori meant something different to being Pākehā or white. I didn't have the language to express this difference, but the racialization of my experience, including the racialization of my body, continued as I grew up. And if you go, so that was my earliest um, kind of experience of racial racism, that moment where my racial innocence was lost and I realized that race is a social construct was actually a thing. Um, and so if you go to my most recent, Jeff, you'll see a photo of my husband and my, um, my children. And this um, in incident happened about three months ago. My youngest boy, um, we were at uh, departments. He was purchasing something 
with his own pocket money um, at the counter with him, uh, I was also purchasing something. I hadn't told him about the, um, about the role of receipts, that when you purchase something, you need to um, also wait for your receipt before you exit the shop. And so he purchased his, um, his toy and I was still at the counter. He went out the shop and he was apprehended by a security guard. And I was stuck at the till still finishing my purchase and uh, looked over at him as he was being uh, questioned and I knew inherently what was going on and my heart dropped and I felt sick and I felt uh, uncertain and shocked and I went over to him and I asked what was going on and he said to me mum the security guard is asking um, if I paid for my toy and I didn't have words in that moment. Um, I went out into the car with him. He could see that I had tears in my eyes and my tears were a reflection of um, what I believe is going to be something that he encounters across the course of his life by virtue of being Māori Pacific. And, um, you know, this racial profiling um, experience that happened for him at age seven um, has been something that I just haven't been able to shake. And as a Māori mother of two beautiful brown boys and a wife of a beautiful dark brown um, New and Cook Island man, I'm often asking myself, how am I showing up for my whānau um, to mitigate the impact, the negative impact of race that uh, we encounter um, on the daily? Um, and... I, 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 I struggle with expect and accept non-closure. That's my most recent. Matt. Oh, I just want to say that's, uh, we're, we're going to have to sort of end here, but what I wanted to, um, thank you, Kat, for sharing that. Um, it's quite awkward online to share <laughs> these personal stories, but thank you for sharing it. And the whole point of that is now race matters. Race matters. Kat's just told you how race matters. And I can see some, Anna Harris says, same experience, Kat. Now, some of you would not have had that experience. So we're starting to build this idea of your story, my story, our story. Our story can be a really sticky, difficult place. But if I speak my truth and you speak your truth and we can hold that space, then we move into the second tier, which is sustain, which we're not going to get to, right? And sustain's about what is the, you know, what's my story, what's your story? What's the dominant narrative? What are we taught a lot of? How do we distinguish um, you know, truth from falsehood or truth from nonsense. Um, and then the final tier, so that's, that's sustained tier. Um, that's really the first tier is learning about understanding your own racial experience as Kat has just laid it out with a couple experience in her own life. Then continuing the conversation means sustaining it. Um, so my experience, what's your experience? Um, we we're going to do an activity on that. We haven't got the time. And then finally, the last tier is deepened because all of this takes place in a, in a power relation. And the last tier, if we can go to the last tier there, which is deepen, um, where we start to deepen your understanding of whiteness and interrogate your beliefs about your own association with and relationship to racial privilege and power. All of these conversations take place in that context, but we can't rush to race to racial privilege before we've understood race in our life. And that's our philosophy. Um, and we, we don't, we, we take two days to get people to this deep in condition because a lot of people need staircasing into it. Um, some people are really comfortable to talk about uh, institutional racism, um, whiteness, um, but actually it does take some scaffolding. And so this final tier, we have to remind people, whiteness is not about white people. Um, whiteness is not an ethnic identity, it's a racial identity. Um, it's not about um, Scottishness or Irishness or any of these other things. It's actually a racial power dynamic um, that came into being at a certain time on the planet and remains significant in the way we live on planet Earth today. And so they're the three tiers. We can't get through them all today. Um, I guess that we're almost coming to an end. Are there any questions? I'll hand back over to Valance and see if there's anything coming through. Yep, we do have some questions. Um, and I'm going to relate it to um, just what you just recently talked about, Matthew, um, which is the, um, the last quarter that you just gave. 
Um, and this is coming from Nika W. How can we best educate ourselves on the impacts and experiences of racism coming from a place of white privilege? Really good question. And you just have to be very mindful of how race impacts your day. And that's how you know. So I've never, I'll give you one example. Um, I've sat in rooms with Kat. Um, and, you know, we have white colleagues who do the work with us too. And no one's ever turned to me in those meetings and said, Matt, can you tell me what the white, even though I'm an Arab, some people see me as white. Um, they will go, Matt, tell me what the white, experience, white perspective or the European perspective. But almost without doubt, I've seen people turn to Kat and Kat has had to give the Māori perspective on everything. Like she can speak for all Māori, like what Māori are one um, homogenous group. Now you've seen this dynamic happen many times. That's why I picked it. I mean, it's happened, it happened count, countless times in my life. But it wasn't until I actually said to myself, hmm, I never get asked that in the day. No one ever asked me that in the course of my day that I really begin to understand that there is a difference. Yeah? Walking into a shop with Kat, we work with a, uh, one of our um, people we work with is a white South African. I've traveled the world with Kat and uh, Sonia, and I've watched them walk into shops. And I know that they both, I know that Kat's a bigger spender than Sonia, but I have watched literally a hundred times a, uh, this happen, or even in bars or wherever we are, the, the person will go directly to Sonia. And they're missing out on business, but that's just a subtle way. And so as I'm noticing this, I'm noticing how this is not happening to me. So what's my experience of race? I don't believe you can really understand racism until you understand your experience of race, because it has to be based somewhere. Now, of course, in our training, we look at cultural racism and then consciousness on day two. So, but that first entry point is race. I hope that helps. So first become aware of how you're being treated in the world, in your workplace, in your personal life. When you walk into a dairy, how does the world treat you by the way you look? And you've got to isolate that from gender to get a real understanding of race. And then you've got to move into sec intersectionality. Kat, do you want to answer um, anything? Um, yeah, I just want to support what Matt said, that it's very t e there is a tendency to jump into wanting to understand the ism or the, the racism or the racist. And actually, uh, we all have skin in the game and <laughs> for want of a better word. Uh, and that race is a social construct. We all have a story about what that is. And so just recognising that um, how you walk in the world how you be in the world, how you are treated in the world, how you are reflected in the world. What is that story? And when you get to grips with self in a really deep sense, um, you're able to pos be positioned. You're able to enable yourself to hear something that is different. To you. But if you don't know who it is that you are, it's gonna be pretty hard to one, hear someone who's different to you, and to believe that difference is happening. Beautiful. Kia ora. Um, we have um, a few other questions and I'm gonna probably put them all into one. Um, this is from Sherry Lee, Lynn DeGraff, and also Emily Beausoleil Leal. Um, also apologies um, from the bottom of my heart if I have mispronounced slightly your name, which is not honoring who you are, but apologies for that. Um, and they're basically saying that, um, this is really awesome. Um, we want to do this workshop. And so it basically boils down to how can we learn more and get involved with the work you're doing and how can we connect this work to structural institutional mm. change? Mm. Mm. Why? Kat, you want to go first? Uh, so the title of our, work, um, our webinar is One Courageous Conversation at a Time. So my belief is that every um, conversation is an opportunity to talk about race. So when we're talking about ins wanting to um, uh, institutions and systems to change, that's going to require us to one, recognize that race matters, two, be able to articulate the way in which race is operating, and three, then be able to um, explore the presence and role in, in how racial privilege and racial power is playing out across people that work inside an institution that has particular policies and practices. So Moana Jackson does a beautiful, I mean, I, he's my hero. Um, 
he has a beautiful articulation of the connection between personal um, experiences of race and racism as they are connected to institutional policies and practices that continue to um, marginalise people of colour and Indigenous people. Matt? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a big question. So, you know, we get to this um, later in the in our workshop, but actually our philosophy is, and it's on the based on the work, uh, systems thinking. Um, you know, I just don't think it's systems thinking, it's just belief systems. Um, everything about the construction of, of New Zealand, um, our, our people find it amazing that things just didn't drop from the sky. You know, everything's been built for one type of people. You know, um, everything's been brought, everything that's been brought here, if it's not indigenous and it's been brought from somewhere, and we have to acknowledge that. Um, so the philosophy is personally, I need to get my internal condition right around this, or I can't really intervene in any way that's productive because every one of us today are going to get up and possibly not today because of um, COVID-19, work in um, institutions that have racial disparities. So it's not enough for me, you know, if, and this is not, I love academia and I love research, but if it, there's a hundred articles every day that you can Google that tell us about race and healthcare, um, race and education, and how this is playing out, or racism, actually, they're really useful, but this is a way of activating it. How do I have the conversation, not only today with my children, Right? How do I keep race on the table with COVID-19? You know, it was really clear at the beginning when people were racially profiling, um, you know, people who looked Asian. And everyone could sit back and go, isn't that terrible? I wouldn't do that, right? Um, that's fine. That was, that was playing out. And that is not at all good. And we must talk about that. But what about the talk now about who are the most vulnerable groups? Who are people who are going to be most impacted by this? Who's, um, you know, who is the colonial history of Aotearoa um, impacted mostly in the healthcare system? That's a more difficult, deeper conversation about institutional racism. But I don't know where to start it if it doesn't start with me. If I'm not talking to my kids about this at home, which I have just done, because I want to, I, I, you know, race matters. It's not the only thing on the table here at the moment, but it has to be put on the table. We have to center it or it always drops off. And I'm starting to see a Maori voices come up and saying, hey, where are we in this package? Where's authentic treaty partnership in this package, this government package, which I applaud the government for doing. But you know, it's just about putting race on the table institutionally, but it must start personally. We've all got work to do. And I'm not preaching to you because my hands are completely dirty. I've made more screw ups in this area. I've made more, um, I've, I've disabled people more than I've enabled them. Um, but I continue to try and work hard on myself and my family and my personal life, my professional life. And that's where institutional fits in for me. So how am I gonna interrupt these structures um, you know, the racist ideas that then you know, are built racist policies and then lead to outcomes. It begins with the belief system, me personally, the belief system that I'm trying to challenge. Um, and that's really, but it's, we take two days to get to present the tools and how, they're, um, how they work in this fashion. Cool. But I suppose on that note then, um, Kōrua, um, and this isn't a, isn't a question, but I know there's a lot of, of the whānau um, in our audience who would really like to connect with you. Um, to learn more about what you're doing, to participate, support Tautoko in any way they can. Um, they can get in contact with you guys. They have your, mm -hmm. well, I just your put details. My one. I put my um, email up. It's mfarry at courageousconversation.com. Um, we're obviously in a wee bit of a difficult situation at the moment, but there's plenty of stuff to get. You know, we can um, connect online as far as face to face, but we can share any part of this work with you and we'd like more people to come involved. If you see some value in this, um, please come, please contact us and see what we can do together, um, together and in partnership around building, contributing um, to a movement that has been going on for years in this country. We're just trying to contribute to that movement in a positive way uh, to take, to make the conversation move it forward. Kilda. Um And maybe one last question to you, Kat. Is it, is it your birthday today? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, it's my birthday is. today. What a treat that I get to begin it with you all. Yes, um, well, thing that is, I love the most to talk about in the world. It is Courtney Prismac's birthday today, I believe. It too. is. Um, so, He's our um, sister from the States. 
So you have not been called out. You have been, we have all been called into the space. So happy birthday to yourself. Thank um, you. Wish Kat a happy birthday, everybody. We're going to close oh, it up no, um, right there. Um, so norera e korua, uh, kayaku rangatira, uh, me te marae kuru e te whatukura. Um, Kat, uh, poia whasi ngā mihi nui ki a koe. Uh, Tā atura ki a koe. E eh, matu, uh, mata whakari pari ngā mihi nui ki a koe. <laughs> Um, and thank you very much for your, our conversation today. Um, in terms of closing remarks, you know, one thing that really resonated for me, um, and I'm sure for many Indigenous people from Aotearoa Māori, is place, name and intention. And when I think of place, name and intention, I think of our own personal pepeha, um, and where we're physically, not only physically, but spiritually located. Um, you know, for, you know for, other, for other cultures, non-Māori cultures, you know, culture, cultural profiling can be quite... Um, a bad thing, but for Māori, cultural profiling is all about um, positionality, like you guys said, um, who you guys are, no hia koe, ko wai koe, and then from there we can have a real honest and transparent conversation. So thank you for your very honest and transparent conversation, ensuring that with the world, and I know that many of us, including myself personally, have got a lot out of this conversation. Mm. So I'm going to wrap it up there, Fano, um, and acknowledge everyone that have um, streamed in. Um, it is 8.40 now, so uh, wherever in the world you, you are, in the morning, the p.m., I wish you the best. Be safe. Kia matara. Be resilient at this time. And I'm just going to close with a karakia, with a prayer. Uh, ko tēnei te inoi uh, ki te ao. Uh, ko tēnei te, te inoi uh, ki tō tātou motu. Uh, ki o tātou uh, rangatira o te motu. Uh, me o tātou whānau kia uhia mai te tō mai rangi atawhai ki tēnā ki tēnō mātou uh, me tēnei uh, māwewi ka pāngia um, ngā whānau katoa putanoi te ao e tēnei i tēnei mate karauna te kau māiwa e ngā o ki hāri ana i te mato te whenua uh, kia uh, hei tohu tohu ia mātou uh, kia puta tātou ki te pai ao ki te ao mārama uhi, wero, tau mai te mauri haumi e Hui ye tai ki ye. Kia ora. Kia ora tātou. Hei kona. Kia ora. Kia ora. Honor and a pleasure.